concluding talk of the conference by Alyosha Buradin, who will talk about algebraic Fourier basis and probability base. Wonderful. It's a misprint. It should be basis. Should be basis. <laughs> you remembered correctly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for staying for the last talk. Um, I guess the two superheroes didn't have um, um, many chances to escape, but the rest of you did. So thank you for for staying here. I shouldn't keep you too long. Um, a lot has been said over the this week of the consequences of the fact that Andre and Pasha were born on the same day. But we what all is the probability yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> in this case the probability is one. Last so. <laughs> <laughs> question you need to repeat the experiment. <laughs> But we all view, <laughs> view the life through our own eyes, so let me um, add my two cents. So, so what do mathematicians do? <laughs> we solve problems. Or rather, we try to solve problems. <laughs> Pretty often. And then um, we fail, also, often. We succeed, rarely. And um, sometimes we try to understand what other people did, probably more rarely than we should. But then there are events in the life of a mathematician that are very rare. And the pressures. These are the events when the research suddenly changes direction. Not for one paper, but for a few years. They in my own life, I can count those easily with fingers on one hand. And they usually come from some sort of an exterior impulse, some impetus that. So is it a Poisson process? <laughs> there are too few events to tell. <laughs> <laughs> and again, my own life, it so happened that two of those came one from Pasha and one from Andre. And so for that, I'm very grateful. And I'm looking forward for more. So I'm happy you had to stay for this talk. So, so I suggest you read papers by Vitti Ginsburg, who also <laughs> was born on the same day. <laughs> in a different year, so. That's certainly a good advice. <laughs> but the impulse doesn't always come from reading papers. <laughs> Even though reading papers is, a, is the right advice to give, that's for sure. All right, so um, given the misprint in, in my title, it should be algebraic Fourier basis and probability. What will this talk be about? It will certainly be much more pedestrian than, uh, um, than most of the talks of this week. My excuse for that is that um, is the word probability at the end. I aim at doing actually some analysis on algebraic objects in the end, which requires some degree of them being explicit. I'll, I'll try to, to tell you three stories about three different algebraic Fourier bases. The first one should be familiar to everybody. I mean, the, the basis, not the story, although the story probably is familiar to a few. Um, the basis is the basis of sure functions, so sure polynomials, the characters of, of the unitary groups. And then the, the two other bases will be slightly more involved. Actually, the second one showed up um, in a much more um, involved situation as a um, uh, stable envelope in, in the talk of Andrei Smirnov. And then the third one is the one for which, um, for which I don't know a geometric interpretation, and I would appreciate if someone tells me. Um, but it's useful, and I'll try to demonstrate what it is. All right, so um, I start with, with the sure functions, and um, there are two purposes for me to tell this story. Um, one is that Andre was involved in it uh, about 20 years ago and made key con contributions, moved the, mo moved the subject forward. And the second one is I hope that, that people who love algebra and geometry and hate probability would see that it's very easy to apply some of the 
most elementary facts in representation theory to produce rather non-trivial consequences and probability. And so that maybe that would entice them to try. So the sure polynomials are written on top. They are, so I'm looking at rational sure polynomials. They are Laurent polynomials in uh, <coughs> N variables um, symmetric. They are the characters of uh, representations of UN. They are orthogonal with respect to the standard dot product on the torus, the weight function being the square um, of the absolute value of the Vandermond determinant. This is what the first orthogonality relation indicates. And the second orthogonality relation is not written in the standard form. You don't need it this way. In the books, it's an infinite sum. Here, as written, the sum diverges. In order to make it convergent, you need to integrate it against the test function. But this is actually a statement about the com completeness of the sure basis in uh, appropriately de defined space of functions on the torus. Choose your favorite space of functions. Um, and then you can integrate both sides, and you'll see that you, have a good, you, get, you get a Fourier decomposition of that function into sure polynomials. So sure polynomials um, satisfy many properties. Most of them are transparent from representation theoretic inter interpretation. Let me go through three, or maybe three and a half of them. These are the only ones I'll need for a probabilistic application. So the first one is the branching rule, is what happens to the representations of the unitary groups when you restrict to the smaller group. And it's reflected at the level of characters by the fact that if you take a sure polynomial, plug in the last, the last variable to be one, then the result decomposes on sure polynomials with, lab with labels with n minus 1 coordinates. And the, condition, uh, the coefficients are, um, well, let's take c equal to 1. So then the coefficients are 0 and 1. And they're 1 when the two partitions interlace. Well, that should be lambda n. This should be lambda 1 through lambda n. Yes. Thank you. More than one misprint in this talk. Um, OK, and uh, what I want to do is I want to pictorially represent this interlacing condition like that. So I'm going to take two vertical lines. I'm, uh, I'm drawing red uh, dots for the positions of shifted coordinates of my partitions. So lambda 1 plus n minus 1, lambda 2 plus n minus 2, and so on. And the same th thing for mu 1, one column to the right. And then the interlacing literally means that I can tile one layer or the piece of this picture by these uh, little rhombi of three different types. That will come into play on the next slide. So the second thing here is something that will be important in all three examples that I'll go through. This is called, usually called in symmetric functions the Cauchy identity. It has a representation theoretic formulation, um, which is, um, this is the um, character way of phrasing the decomposition of the um, space of polynomial functions of, on matrices with respect to the action of two copies of GL by ro uh, on rows and then columns. And um, this is the character of the left-hand side. This is the character of the right-hand side. It can also be proved in a much more elementary way just using the formula for sure polynomials. And the third way, um, the, third, the third property over here are two operators that leave um, sure polynomials invariant. And they are eigenfunctions for these operators. Um, this one is um, a relative of the, uh, of the Casimir operators. But um, I took a discrete version, a Q version of it. So this is an explicit Q difference operator that gives this eigenvalue here. And the Schur polynomial, again, can be proved straightforwardly using a formula for the Schur polynomial. And the second one is known as the Pieri rule. And that, that what, that's what happens when one multiplies the Schur polynomial by um, the sum of all variables, or tensor multiplies the representation by the tautological one, and then decomposes into a reduce. I won't need this, but I will use that. So I hope these are clear. I hope most of you have seen this before or taught them. And, and they're, they're immediately checkable within 15 minutes. 
And uh, they are sufficient to produce rather non-trivial probabilistic statements. So let me tell you how this works. And again, Andre is, is responsible for this largely. Uh, my probabilistic, oops, my probabilistic object will be um, a measure on all plane partitions. So plane partitions are staircase pictures like this. They are they are made of one by one by one cubes that are stacked in the corner of the room without holes or overhangs. I will put a, put a probability measure on them, which is a Q raised to the number of boxes used to build the staircase, so Q raised to the volume over here. And I claim that this measure is actually closely related to this identity over here. Now, in order to see that, I'm going to slice the, um, the picture by vertical lines. And so the central vertical line over here gives me a partition in the intersection. So the partition here um, consists of coordinates of these red rhombi unshifted. So this is similar to what was happening here. And then when I go to the right and to the left, my partitions will interlace. And so if I put to any neighboring two lines a factor, which is a skew sure functions, or rather this coefficient over here, q raised to an appropriate power, and then if I collect all weights across the picture, that will produce for me q to the volume. So here I wrote it as the product of two sure functions with certain powers of q as arguments. These powers of q come up when I start branching to the right and to the left. This is literally just the product of these factors over all neighboring lines. And so an immediate consequence of that is that if I try to compute the partition function or the sum of q to the volume over all plane partitions, this produces the right-hand side of the Cauchy identity, this object here for specific values of z and w. And this is a nice formula. It's very well known. It goes back more than 100 years. It's known as McMahon's identity. But more can be done. So what I said is that uh, my measure over here is a specialization of the Cauchy identity. So let me take the Cauchy identity. This is the, what goes into the Cauchy identity. And let me apply to it a few operators with respect to which the sure functions are eigenfunctions. So if I do that, this is the operator. If I do that, what happens is that each sure function spits out an eigenvalue. So there will be an eigenvalue appearing here instead of these operators. And then this expression becomes an expectation of an observable equal to the product of these eigenvalues with respect to the weights given by um, the Cauchy identity. So then I divide by the total sum. And then this expression is, an expected, is the expected value of a certain observable that depends on coordinates of this partition, or it could be, well, of this partition. There are many parameters in these observables. There are q1 through qm over here. That's the number of operators that I apply. This object here is elementary. The right-hand side of the Cauchy identity is elementary. This is just uh, this product over here. And then I apply to it simple Q difference operators, this gives me something very elementary. So all these averages are explicit. Now, once this is done, one can do a little bit of analysis that I'm skipping here. And then this really kills the problem of asymptotic analysis of plane partitions as the size of partitions goes to infinity. So this means that Q here is going to 1, and that the partition becomes bigger and bigger. This is what you see typically if you simulate it. And then uh, probabilistically, this picture demonstrates uh, uh, several different meaningful behaviors. First, there is a limit shape. Something like that appeared in, in, in Rick Kenyon's talk. Um, you see a, a smooth surface over here that, that, that is going to be deterministic and that, all, uh, and that the, part, the random partitions will almost surely approximate. If you zoom inside, then you're going to see a lattice structure, and then certain translation variant Gibbs measures show up there. 
And one can look at the edge, and then one sees something called the airy processes. They are, they have their natural home in random matrix theory. And uh, and if one looks at global correlations of the height around the uh, um, the smooth function, then this wild picture shows up. And this is a, a key object in two-dimensional probability. This is the Gaussian field, field the conformal invariant object in, in, in the correct conformal structure. All this is extractable from this line with few computations. So um, actually, the top and the third are results from a paper of Andrei with, with Richard Tikkin back in 2001. All right, so this is my... Um, this is my first story, sort of well understood, lots of followers. And uh, um, now let me go to the second. Now the second story concerns a different, um, not too different, but somewhat different probabilistic system known as the six vertex model. So the six vertex model dates back a long time to 1935 to the work of chemists actually to one chemist named Linus Pauling. And what uh, this uh, remarkable scientist and rather controversial figure actually towards the end of his life, what he tried to do was explaining something called residual entropy in ice um, at temperatures near absolute zero. Um, there is some amount of chaos remaining in, in ice near absolute zero, and it wasn't clear what it was coming from. And so Pollen attributed that to a freedom of um, choice in, in some configuration of actual atoms in ice. So the red balls over there are oxygens, and they are connected to each other. This is the crystal lattice of ice. They're connected by hydrogen bonds. Each oxygen has four bonds attached to it. And uh, the hydrogen atoms, for each oxygen, there are two that are nearby, and there are two that are further away. This is the H2O formula of water. And one wants to compute the total number of configurations that are allowed in this way in a large volume. And that should predict something experimental. That was polling suggestion. Nobody can compute asymptotically what happens for three-dimensional ice, even, even now. Now, Pauling, of course, did a, a, um, a wonderful approximation. He counted the number of local configurations for each oxygen. And so that's just the binomial coefficient 4 choose 2. It's 6, because there are four edges, and two of them are occupied by hydrogens that are close, and two are away. So that's... Um, the origin for the six vertex model. And his approximation actually fell within 10% of, of the experimental value. So that was a, a, a great success. How binomial coefficients can explain um, absolute zero experiments. Um, but um, in any case, so the three-dimensional model remains out of reach, but the two-dimensional model, a replacement of the, of the crystal lattice of ice by the square lattice, um, um, was used since the 50s, and that is a much, much better object from the point of view of mathematics. So here, on the two-dimensional lattice, there are six possible configurations, similar as, as here. And there is a bijection that allows to um, change these six local configurations into six pictures on the lattice like that, after which the configuration of ice becomes a configuration of lattice paths that go in the upright direction that are allowed to touch. Okay. This is what, what is usually used as six, six vertex models these days, and this is what Rick Kenyon used in his talk. So the model is a probability measure on configurations like that, where the weight of a configuration is the product, of, the product of weights of vertices where each type of a vertex can carry its own, its own number. For the square ice, so for, for Poland's original idea, all weights will be one, but in general, there are six different weights. Um, Leap succeeded in computing um, the square ice, the number of square, square ice configuration on the large torus asymptotically. That was, um, that was a big success and a very famous paper. Now, um, so there are other classes of 
similar models. Some of them I will use later. This is um, this is the so-called highest spin model. So these are the so. In this picture over here, each edge can carry at most one path, but that doesn't need to be the case. Edges could carry multiple paths. This is um, usually known as the highest spin six vertex model. Oh uh, well, or highest spin vertex model period. That's because um, from a representation theoretic point of view, this means that one utilizes highest spin representations of um, GL2 or other groups for um, the universal R matrix, but I'll, uh, maybe I'll get to that later. Um, then there are so-called um, face models. So there is a natural way to parameterize a picture like this by the height function. I didn't say it this way. So this is the function that changes value by one when one crosses each path. So it's, if it's zero here, then it's going to be one here, two here, three, and so on. And so um, the, um, the vertex models have weights that depend only on the gradient of the height function, but one can consider models that depend on the height function itself. Um, they typically arise when one looks at dynamic young Baxter equation or at elliptic situation, things like that. And then, um, so these, um, they have two different names, solid and solid interaction around the face. And then the ones that I'll be interested in in the third story that I'll try to, to, to tell, the, these are called colored models. That's when paths can carry different colors. So from representation theoretic of view, this means that one looks at higher rank groups rather than um, SL2 or GL2. One looks at, at GLN, and then the colors correspond to simple roots of, um, of GLN. OK, so this is a. Um, um, material that probably is familiar to, to many people in this audience, why the models, um, why the six vertex model and, and, and further and its descendants, why they allow for complete solutions is because inside of the model there, there is a large family of commuting operators, that's the quantum integrability. So the commuting operators um, show up from uh, um, the trans so-called transfer matrices. So this here is a picture of a transfer matrix. This is just one layer of the model. So I, I close it up here so the model is actually on, on the cylinder, on the circle. And then um, the, the uh, uh, matrix element of this matrix is parameterized by um, the inputs, the arrows that come from the bottom, the output, the arrows that come on the top. And then the value is the product of weights of individual vertices. And the big discovery that, um, um, well, that probably Baxter should be most credited with that led later to the creation of the, of the quantum groups was the fact that the weights, the parameters in the weights can be separated in such a way that one parameter can be allowed to vary so that the transfer matrices commute. So if one utilizes, so this is a particular example of a, of the, of a higher spin um, six vertex model. This is, uh, these are weights, they're written in, in a strange form but there is a reason for that, and the reason is that there is one parameter u that's being separated over here, and if that parameter u changes between different transfer matrices, then these transfer matrices commute, and that's, that's why the model can be integrated, basically. Um, I think the, uh, the role of the, of the non-triviality of the fact that the weights can be split into, in, into this way is, is often underestimated. It was really Baxter's achievement for the eight vertex model that, that moved the subject forward. All right, so um, there is, I, I put down a, a picture that I won't go through. That's the proof of the commutation of two transfer matrices. Once one knows what one is doing, um, it's very easy. It's called a zipper argument. One takes a zipper and moves it around the circle. And, and, and it is based on the Young-Baxter equation, which is um, a remar remarkable equation satisfied by the weights once the parameterization is correct. And this is just the equality of two little partition functions with uh, fixed boundary conditions on the left and on the right. Okay. So, um, looks simple, but really one of the deepest relations I know. Okay, so this is all old stuff. And uh, the thing that, um, one thing that I want, uh, one new element that I want to bring up is, is um, something that, um, that we call stochasticity of weights. So the stochasticity of weights is the following property. If I take weights of a vertex, and then if I add them up over the possible values 
of the number of outcoming um, edges on top and on the bottom. Then I want to get one. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, that means imagine that um, you are trying to build a vertex configuration step by step. And so you have something that, that comes into the vertex from the bottom and from the left. Then something happens in that vertex, and that vertex spits out the same arrows up and to the right with some probabilities. Okay, that's what it means. This is an example. Um, this is the case of the six vertex, so six configurations. Um, and here, there, there, there are not many choices. So if the arrow comes alone, then it has a probability B1 to go straight or turn right, which is complementary, 1 minus B1. Same for coming from the left. And then if two of them come, then they don't have any choice. Um, this is a similar example for many colors. So if, many co if there are many colors, one can just dedicate, uh, one can just order them in some way and say that um, the, the, older the older color or the, the heavier color decides what's going on. So the heavier co color becomes the, in the same way as it does here, which is it enters and then it decides what it's going to do, turn or go straight. And then the other color does the complementary thing. Now this, uh, uh, this is a special case of the more general six vertex model. And uh, it allows for more analysis. The six vertex model is, is, is pretty notorious in not allowing mathematicians to do much with it. So, we, we, um, so Rick's talk was on some specific um, limiting case of the six vertex model. This is another case of six vertex model that, that allows for, um, for many things to be done, um, thanks to a certain Fourier basis that is coming up. Now, um, I wanted to maybe briefly say that one can wonder how generic is the fact that one can produce stochastic weights. And um, it turns out that that's pretty generic. So whenever one has um, something satisfying young Baxter equation, one can produce stochastic weights out of it that will satisfy young Baxter equation um, two. And there is a little cartoon on, on, on the slide that, that attempts to explain the procedure in order to produce a stochastic weight, one takes, so the stochastic weight here to me is, is the double circle in the center. Um, one attaches um, an additional line and then takes the value, which is the product of three weights here and then divides by the normalizing value. And then the young Baxter equation for this picture gives um, the stochasticity condition. And then a graphical argument shows that the new weights will satisfy the young Baxter equation as well. So there's a generic procedure that produces these stochastic um, um, solutions to the Baxter equation. It works pretty well. Um, it even works for tetrahedron equation for, for the three-dimensional analog of, of the Jan Baxter equation, although it's not clear what to do with the result probabilistically, but it does exist. OK, so now um, this stochasticity puts the six vertex model in a different physical class of models it becomes what's called the non-equilibrium model, which means that you can grow it step by step. Now, originally, the six vertex model is a model of configurations on a domain where you fix boundary conditions and you look at what happens in between. Now, rather than doing that, what we're gonna do, we're gonna fix the, the configuration on part of the boundary and then propagate it using the Markovian rule. So, you know, the this, this stochasticity means that if I know on some part of the boundary how many paths I have, I can propagate that step by step. And then I get something in the domain. Right? So, so are we assuming that the weights are non-negative? We're assuming that, well, for that, we're assuming that the weights are non-negative. Of course, this procedure may produce negative weights if the original weights are negative. But typically, there is a domain in which the weights are positive. There are such, some situations when it fails. For elliptic models, it's not so easy to find such a domain. But uh, yes, for probabilistic applications, we need to assume they're non -negative. So then the transfer matrix, which is a layer um, operator, it moves arrows one step up, uh, different ways to introduce it, it could go diagonally as well. This becomes a, a stochastic matrix, so the sum of um, matrix elements over all rows is one. And uh, if we manage to diagonalize it, then we can do analysis to it. We can actually analyze what happens to the picture when, when things get large. Right? So this is a particular example of a stochastic model. These are stochastic weights on top. Um, if you add these ones here, um, they're, they're, they're supposed to give one as the sum. So that means we have m arrows entering and either. Um, the 
Yes, that is true. If your weights are, so what Andre is saying is that in the case that the weights are stochastic, an alternative way to building um, the thing step by step is by, is by imposing the other, is to impose a free boundary condition on the other end of the domain. So on one domain, something is entering, and then on the other domain, everything is free. So whatever exits is fine. So in this way, the two settings are, are, are sort of interconnected, the equilibrium one, non-equilibrium one. But for equilibrium one, people like to set the fixed boundary conditions and see what happens. All right, so um, the, the there are fewer Gibbs measures in this situation, yes. There are fewer Gibbs measures, and I'll, 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 I'll get to that a little later. Once I get to the analysis part, I'll, I'll, I'll say what I want to say. All right, so um, this is a transfer matrix as usual, right? This is a stochastic matrix, and this is the eigenbasis for um, the, the transfer matrix. Now, maybe I should be more careful with the eigenbasis, because in order to talk about eigenbasis, I need to fix um, the boundary conditions. I need to say whether I'm working on a finite segment or an infinite segment, or what am I doing? Now, the typical physics papers that would deal with that would put some boundary conditions on, on a finite segment over here, and then we are on a finite state space, which means that there are finitely many um, eigenfunctions. And so that means that these parameters here would need to be specialized into something. And that something would be solutions of the so-called beta equations, which are nonlinear equations. Very hard to study. Well, still, well. But that's not, that's not something I want to do. I want to get rid of the beta equations. And so to do that, what I'll do is I'll consider the transfer matrix on the complete lattice. So I'll take the full lattice. No boundary conditions. Well, okay, nothing on the left, nothing on the right. Finitely many arrows traveling through. Finitely many coming in and out. Yeah, the so-called finite magnum sector in physics terminology. Yes. So in that case, this is roughly uh, this is a glorified difference operator on 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 a few um, on a few lattice points. Um, then my parameters u1 and u1 through un are completely arbitrary. They're just complex numbers. And one can do analysis by trying to do some sort of Fourier, tra Fourier transform on such functions. So I need to really select some of them that would form an orthogonal basis, and then I can do things with them. So they satisfy a certain orthogonality relation that's written here. Hopefully it reminds you a little bit of, of the sure orthogonality that I had before. These are, um, these are, these have a different name, so they, they've been, uh, well, they have several different names. They're called off-shell beta ve vectors in physics literature. They were called weight functions by, um, in the works of um, Tarasso, Varchenko, and Felder. And this relation, particularly here, the earliest reference I know is, is in a paper by Tarasso and Varchenko in 97. Maybe Sasha will correct me if this is incorrect. I think that the, uh, um, but I mean, I guess the point that I want to make here is that these functions should be treated in, in the spirit of symmetric function theory. And that hasn't been done before, or not much in any case. Rather than plugging in the roots of beta equations, one should really think of these variables as being free and compare um, the, the corresponding functions, which is, a, so this is a symmetric function, symmetric rational function in variables u in terms of um, standard, standard things in, in, sym in symmetric function theory. So the so there is one additional <coughs> parameter. Yeah. There is uh, one. Uh, so I'll, I'll say something about the parameters right away. Um, so there are there are two parameters in what's written. There is a Q and there is an S. So S um, it really comes from the highest weight of the representation that's being used on the columns. Or you know, this is the spin parameter. Um, by setting it to a particular value, I can enforce the six vertex condition, for example. Um, so if one sets both parameters to be zero, then this is a sure polynomial. There is, uh, I'm back to the previous story. If I set the spin parameter to be zero, this is um, this is a whole whole, whole little wood polynomial, and they uh, they arise in um, periodic representation theory. Um, but a whole little polynomial have a deformation, which is Macaulay. Yes, so and that. I don't have the correct definition. I can, well, people, or, and I can extend it to, to the McDonald parameter as well, but uh, I'm not sure that's the right extension. I don't have sufficiently many properties to know that that's the correct extension. So yes, the answer is no. It so does you so don't far. expect a good theory with three parameters, right? 
there might be more parameters if I extend. So maybe four, I don't know. These are essentially these are essentially x x z uh, eigenfunctions. So they they are they are more general than the the delta Bose gas eigenfunctions. The relativistic, I'm not sure that's the correct word. I mean, f is zero, then these are the functions of the Bose gas. Is if. Um, Now the Bose the Bose Bose gas arises when actually everything goes to one and this becomes a rational factor. Yeah, and this is a trigonometric analog. Yeah. So what happens if you set q to one? If you set q to one, well, in this definition, nothing well, good okay, uh, happens. <laughs> So literally setting q to 1, it doesn't make too much sense. But sending q to 1 together with everything gives a rational limit, which is what, what Nikita was asking. I don't think just blank that send, sending q to 1 will give anything. OK, so um, my, my next step will be to, so this is also a formula for something called coordinate better ansatz in, um, in integrable systems. The, the, the typical formula is the linear combination of plane waves. So these are plane waves, and this is a linear combination. Now I want to put it in the framework of algebraic better ansatz, so that's a few years forward. And so for that, I will introduce these A and B operators that are one row operators with certain, they're similar to the transfer <coughs> matrix, but my boundary condition. So this is literally transfer matrix. And here, my boundary conditions is that I have an entering arrow here, nothing here. And then uh, the F function is this partition function. This is a, a, um, a well-known formula in bad answers. Um, if so, literally the statement is that if I compute this partition function with the weights of my model, I will recover my function back. It's not it's not obvious, but it's true. This is similar to the decomposition of a Schur polynomial as, as the sum over a semi-standard Young table. Now there are also dual functions. So dual functions are given as these partition functions. And now it becomes essential for me that I'm working over higher spin. Because in spin half, or in the situation of the six, <coughs> of the six vertex, <coughs> sorry, in the six vertex model, <coughs> I would be unable to put this boundary condition here on the bottom. Right? So I have arrows entering through a single, a, a single uh, site over here, and then they spread. They have a similar formula to this, uh, but I didn't want to put it down. These dual functions, they, um, they play a role because they enter the Cauchy identity. So if one now couples the Fs and the Gs defined as this and this, then the right-hand side is a, is a product formula similar to the Cauchy product formula. And when one sets S to 0, this is the Cauchy identity for whole Littlewood polynomials. So we're back to the same setup. This is just the eigenrelation with the, with the, um, with the transfer matrix. So again, um, this basis and the properties that I listed are, are sufficient to, to do probability, you know, a rather non-trivial one. This picture here is supposed to symbolize the Cauchy identity and its similarity to, to tilings, but uh, I won't go into that. So this is a, a, a model on which I want to do the analysis. This is the stochastic six vertex model. I have many paths that enter through one, two, three, four, five, and so on. They propagate by the rules that each of them decides at each vertex whether it wants to go right or it wants to go straight. If two of them meet, they have nothing to decide. They just go further. So then if you simulate it on a computer, that's what you see. Uh, you want to know what you see. There are some things that, that, that seem obvious, like maybe this is a straight line, and maybe this is a straight line too. But then how does one describe um, the picture over here? I'll use the height function um, to, dis to, to, to talk about the situation. Again, the height function is it's a way to parameterize this picture by a function that changes value by 1 when I um, cross a line. All right, and so this is a, a, an example of a statement. It's already five years old that can be proved using the Fourier basis that I just used, that I just described. And so the, the statement is the following. That if I look at this picture over here, I take it very large. I look at the point inside. Then the height function grows linearly in the size of the picture 
with the rate that's known. It's actually elementary. It's given here. B1 and B2 are the two probabilities for the paths to go straight and, and uh, in the vertical and horizontal direction. But there is a, so that's the law of large numbers. So the, 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 uh, the approximately, if I draw this as a random surface, then there will be a limiting surface with, with certain smooth limiting surface. The, uh, these two are indeed straight lines. They are the, the edges of that, of that limiting surface. And then there is more than that. There is also the, uh, the statement about the fluctuations. There is a, a non-standard anomalous, I would say, a fluctuation exponent one-third for the fluctuations of the height function. This is an unusual situation for a two-dimensional model. A two-dimensional model is supposed to be conformally invariant. But this is an example when it is not. So this is an instance of a six-vertex model that produces a different behavior. Um, and that behavior is, again, related to random matrix theory, but I'll, I, I won't go into that. All right. So now I get to my third story, and that really is the, the story that, that, that I wanted to tell, that the rest um, was some sort of a warm-up. So this story, so the model itself is uh, very similar to the, to the stochastic six vertex. So again, I have arrows. They enter um, the vertices, and then they decide how they go. And so they decide according to the decision of the, of the warmer color in this picture. Right? So, um, and that's, that's the rule. And this is a simulation. This is, the, uh, this, is, this is a simulation of particular boundary conditions. So the, the weakest color enters here, and then, uh, and then the strongest enters here, and then off they go. And so if you forget the distinctions about the colors, you get the picture from the previous slide, for some reason reflected uh, across the diagonal. But then when you see these two pictures next to each other, then you know which picture do you want to live in, this one or this one? Well, it becomes obvious. Um, it's much, well, it's harder to study the picture on the right, but uh, well, it's appealing. OK, so now my vertex model is the vertex model with colors. On the, um, I will choose um, the horizontal edges to be still occupied by a single edge, and the vertical edges as before by a single path, and the vertical edges as before can be mul can be occupied by multiple paths. These are explicit weights for the model. They have the same parameters. They have a Q. They have S, which is the spin parameter that governs the highest weight of the representation sit sitting on 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 the. Um, on the vertical lines, and then there is a spectral parameter x. There is a transfer matrix just as well. So this is just a, a, a version of the uh, of the R matrix for um, well, for for GLM. That's what it is when the representation on on the on the board on, on the vertical is chosen in a, in a suitable way, and the representation um, on the horizontal edges is just the topological vector. So the functions that are eigenfunctions of the transfer matrix, these are the functions. Okay. So these functions, um, I would love if I could now say that, well, they were considered by x under the weight of y. And uh, there is an algebra, well, there's a geometric picture that tells you how they come up. I don't know that geometric picture. Okay. But in the previous case, the, 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 the geometric picture. So in the, in the previous case, uh, um, uh, the, the elliptic stable envelopes that were discussed earlier by Andrei Smirnov and, and worked on by the other Andrei in the audience, uh, they degenerate, or well, they degenerate in, in, in some situation to the previous functions, yes. Yeah, these were the ones that, uh, so this object here is an example of a stable envelope. Yeah. Now, I cannot say the same about this object over here, but these functions are useful. And I'll, I'll, I'll connect them to non-symmetric McDonald theory later. I'll do a little bit of probability with them. And um, a recent preprint, actually, from number theorists shows that um, a similar object for um, super Lie algebras um, computes values of something called Iwahori Whitaker um, functions for GL over non Archimedean fields. So they, they, they have a role. Um, I want to have more of an understanding of what they are. So here are a few properties, again, that are sufficient to do some probability with, with them. 
So this is the connection um, to the previous situation, to, to the stable envelopes. If I take my function, so now what are they, so the, this function, what is, the, what is it parameterized by? First, again, I have colors entering uh, one through five. So the weakest one in the is in the bottom, the strongest one on top. There are spectral parameters sitting in rows. These are my variables. And then the top is a composition. So that's just a way to arrange integers um, the positions where my paths will exit. And they can exit in various possibilities. So the, um, um, the first statement here is that if I add up all possibilities to exit over here, if I permute all colors in all possible way ways, then I get back to the previous function. This is the color blindness property. I can project onto all colors being the same by symmetrizing. This is a reasonably obvious, I would put it this way. Now, when um, the labels on top are in anti-dominant order, this function splits into a, a single monomial. And that corresponds to the fact that there is only one path configuration that will satisfy the corresponding condition. And then a less obvious property is that if I take, for example, this one, and then if I try to swap two colors on top, that can be done by an action of a Hecke operator. So there is an action of a Hecke operator that allows one to go from this trivial case to generic case. Now, in the previous case, these were not only stable envelope from sta stable, stable, stable envelopes, but they were also off-shell beta vectors. What about off-shell beta vectors in... Uh, in the high rank situation. They certainly exist. So if I want, so, so Fitz has spent a lot of time on that. If they want to diagonalize a spin chain or a vertex model with, with closed boundary conditions, with periodic boundary conditions, they're gonna write an expression and then specialize variables into solutions to some equation. So this is the expression that they would write. This is a partition function. Uh, so the expression would be a partition function of a picture like that. Um, built of several blocks with specific way to specialize colors the way they enter. And then uh, there will be n times n plus 1 over 2 spectral parameters that enter in this particular picture. And then they would be specialized into solutions of nested beta equations. So this is a, a, a um, system of transcendental equations that are solved one by one in order to understand what they are. Now, my goal is to get rid of beta equations. So if I just forget the beta equations, I get some functions. There are actually explicit formulas for them, again, so thanks to, to Tarasov and Marchenko work. But there are too they're, they're too big for my purposes. The, the, there are too many variables. There are too many functions. So what happens is to get these functions that I'm talking about, I need to specialize these variables in a specific way. Namely, I take a single variable from the nth group here, um, and my all groups here, I set it to x1, then I take a variable from the remaining groups, I set it to x2, and so on. That brings down the dimension in, in variables to, to n, and that's the object that I'm looking at. So this is some sort of a specialization of the off-shell beta vectors in the, in the high rank case. I don't know what that means. I haven't seen that before. It's just a, but it gives a way, actually, to write an explicit formula. If one starts with Tarasov, Tarasov, Archenko formula, that gives a big symmetrization formula for this object and then plugs in the specialization that spits out the formula. You can put it on a computer. Okay, <coughs> a couple of properties. So there is a Cauchy identity. The Cauchy identity is on top. It, um, it's a different Cauchy identity from the ones I wrote. In particular, this product here is non-symmetric. My, my functions are non-symmetric anymore, right? I mean, that, as was obvious from the monomial formula. The formula um, of this type appeared before in non-symmetric McDonald theory, actually. There's a formula that was derived by Mimachi and Naomi for non-symmetric McDonald polynomials after the work of Sahi, who, who did it for Jack polynomials, for non-symmetric Jack polynomials, with a similar type of the right-hand side. And I'll, I'll get to that in, in, in a bit. But anyway, this is a rather, well, it's a pretty, pretty enough to me. The right-hand side is a, is, a, is a product. And again, this is a partition function for some Domain? Hmm? It should be Y's, yes, okay, so thank you, that's the third misperception. Yes, it should be X and Y, thank you, Vit. 
All right, and the second property is orthogonality. This is really essential to me because if I want to do any kind of analysis, I need a Fourier basis. I don't just want to write some eigenfunctions. I need to be able to diagonalize a transform matrix with them in order to compute something. So they are orthogonal with respect to a certain dot product. Well, you can call it in different ways. This thing is is um, ah. is is a similar object with ah. inverted variables, and, uh, and formally speaking, yes, but not really. Okay. So I'm back to, to, to my pictures. I want to state a, a, a probabilistic theorem proved by 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 this tool by using this basis. So I, I consider this model. I'll look at this model. Actually, I'll compare this model, this one and this one. And so um, these are two pictures. This is the colorblind one. This is the colored one. And so if I uh, now look at some rectangle and I look at the set of colors that exit on the right, that's a random subset of, uh, of numbers 1 through n. That's a random subset of colors that entered here. And then in this case, if I, I can look at the set of positions where the exits and exit, where the arrows exit in the color blend situation. And so the statement is that this random subset of 1 through n has the same distribution as this random subset from 1 to n. It's easy to formulate, but this is a rather mysterious statement. And uh, I would hope that there is some representation theoretic explanation for that. I have no idea whether there is one. Um, it's also pretty powerful. So things that it allows one to, to prove, for example, are the following. So for example, if one takes the bottommost path here, so this is the darkest uh, purple color that there is. So that path is going to go somewhere. And one wants to know, for example, how it is distributed in the whole picture. And so that correspondence reduces that statement to the density of paths in this picture. And that we know from before. And there are several other pic that several other questions that can be that can be answered by this correspondence. Right? But again, I um, it's not a triviality, and um, and I don't really understand the structural reasons for for this to hold. So the last thing that I want to say is the connection to non-symmetric polynomials. Right. So I said before that the that these functions that I write they don't really. So if I specialize a parameter, they, they become whole little woods. And actually, the, um, you know, these objects here, they, they become non-symmetric whole little woods if I set s to 0. So that's consistent. But then whether I can put the McDonald parameter in, that's what Pasha is. So that I cannot meaningfully do, at least not yet. But what I can do is I can write a formula for non-symmetric polynomials in the same spirit. So this is my previous picture. I will set s to 0, first step. The second step, I will replace the letter q by the letter t, because somehow the letter q of quantum group play is the same as the letter t in McDonald theory. And then I will allow my paths to circle around. And every time they circle around, so they're now on a cylinder, not just on a plane domain. And every time they circle around, I will put a factor which is a monomial in q and t. So some power of q times some power of t. If I do that, then my claim is that the partition function of this picture is the non-symmetric polynomial labeled by the composition over here. So I'll, um, I'll add maybe one word to that, that. That somehow tells me that this is not such a bad way to write a non-symmetric McGraw polynomial. So non-symmetric McGraw polynomials are rather non-explicit objects. and um, they can be they can be um, described by orthogonality statements, Gram-Schmidt process, or by the fact that they are eigenfunctions of uh, Chernyk-Dunkel operators. So Chernyk-Dunkel operators turn out act very nicely in this picture. So the way Chernyk-Dunkel operators act, they essentially act by one shift of a cylinder, sort of one switch of a cylinder. This picture is on a cylinder. One rotates the cylinder by one by um, by one unit. And then what happens is that not only the whole partition function transforms in the right way with an eigenvalue, but every term of the partition function, so every picture one has, 
transforms into a legal picture on a rotated cylinder with a factor. That factor is the same, and that is the eigenvalue of the turning dunkel operator. So something, something nice structurally happens uh, when one writes a partition function in, 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 in this way. And, and do you have difference operator when you have Q and S rather than Q and S? No. So the, uh, well, no, Q and S, yes. With Q and S, yes, there is a difference operator. It's actually the same difference operator as, uh, um, as for whole little woods. These functions, wow. well, but one needs, to do, one needs to make these functions stable. So in the symmetric case, there is a way, a way to make them stable under adding zeros at the end, or adding s's at the end. And then that object is, is an eigenfunction of the whole little difference operator, of all of them, of all whole little difference operators. And is there a finite range version of this theory, or only an infinite domain with the S? Like McDonald's has the... No, no, the, well, the, the functions are the infinite variables. It's just I modify them so that they become stable under... Okay. No, I don't consider function infinitely many variables, no. But the operators only exist if you do infinite domain. No, infinitely many variables. And they are the same as usual? They are the same as, as whole little word operators. Well, the space is but different. The functions are polynomial. The functions are rational. Yeah. Yes, they're rational. They are rational eigenfunctions of those. They are rational eigenfunctions of those. But you're saying that in what space they form a basis? You're saying that you have a Fourier basis, but yeah. a Fourier basis of what space? They, they form a basis in, in, in the space of, um, of Laurent polynomials with, with the prescribed um, set of um, resi well, with residues at with zeros at s and poles at 1 over s. But the problem is I'm going to substitute for symmetristic conditions. Now here, these are just all polynomials. There is no symmetricity conditions. Similar as non-symmetric polynomials, McDonald polynomials form a basis in all polynomials in a given number of variables. In the, the, the symmetric condition I need for the colorblind theory, yes. Here, there is no condition. I mean, I need the finite, I mean, I need the convergence condition if I want to talk about the Fourier basis, but that's a different story. All right, um, where was it? Here. All right, yeah. So I was saying that McDonald's somehow fit there, but whether one can add both parameters there, I don't know. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for staying, and congratulations. <laughs>